Hello, everyone. Greetings from the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. I'm Jay Wong, the director of the USC Center on Public Diplomacy. And I'm Barry Sanders, chair of the Center on Public Diplomacy, which is the Annenberg School Center devoted to the art and science of communicating with global populations in the interests of the nation. Public diplomacy is at the intersection of communications and world affairs. We're joined on this session by several of my fellow board members, all of whom are distinguished observers and participants in the field of international relations, including Nathan Gardells, Mel Levine, Mike Metavoy, and Marie Royce. And in concert with them and the rest of our board, I welcome you to this important and extraordinarily timely session. We're proud to be your host. Okay. Thanks, Barry. Indeed, you know, this moment really reminds us of the limits of hot power, but the essential importance of a diplomacy that balances vital national interest and global leadership. We are so delighted to host today's discussion. I'm going to introduce uh, Willow Bay, Dean of the USC Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism and Walter Annenberg Chair in Communication. Uh, she will introduce our distinguished guest and moderate today's dis discussion. Uh, Dean Bay, thanks for joining us from the Wallace Annenberg Hall. I turn the program over to you. Thank you, thank you, Jay, and thank you, Barry, and thank you to all of you who are joining us. Um, it is my special pleasure to introduce Wendy R. Sherman, the country's Deputy Secretary of State. I am proud to note, particularly given our school community here in Annenberg is majority female, that the Deputy Secretary is the first woman to hold this position. Deputy Secretary Sherman comes to this job with a wealth of experience in global affairs and public diplomacy, serving three of our nation's presidents. During the Clinton administration, she served as State Department counselor under Secretary Madeleine Albright, who, by the way, called her America's smartest and most dedicated diplomat. Also as a special advisor to President Clinton and policy coordinator on North Korea, and as Assistant Secretary for Legislative Affairs under Secretary Warren Christopher. In the Obama White House, Deputy Secretary Sherman served as Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, where she traveled to 54 countries and led the U.S. negotiating team that reached agreement on a joint comprehensive plan of action between the P5 plus one, the European Union, and Iran. She was awarded the National Security Medal by President Barack Obama for her diplomatic accomplishments. Today in her role as the nation's number two diplomat, Deputy Secretary Sherman has circumnavigated the globe twice since being sworn in in April. In July, she was the first senior Biden-Harris administration official to visit the People's Republic of China for wide ranging diplomatic talks, which diplomatically speaking, Deputy Secretary sounded like a whole lot of fun. Deputy Secretary Sherman also comes with substantial street, street cred in the academic community. She was professor of the practice of public leadership and director of the Center for Public Leadership at the Harvard Kennedy School. She was also a senior fellow at the school's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. She's also an author of Not for the Faint of Heart, Lessons in Courage, Power, and Persistence, which offers a riveting look inside the world of diplomacy done Deputy Secretary Sherman's way. Deputy Secretary Sherman will share her remarks and then we'll take a few moments for conversation between the two of us. And then I will open it up to this audience for question. Deputy Secretary Sherman, welcome to Annenberg. Thank you for making this visit. I know we had to pivot to a virtual meeting, but in an effort to give you just a little bit of sense of the life on our campus where students have returned to in-person classes um, for the first time in a very long time, I'm coming to you from the atrium in Wallace Annenberg Hall. Um, so you may get a sense of just a little bit of the action um, behind me and, and some of the sounds from below me. And now I'm delighted to welcome you and to invite you to share some remarks. Good afternoon to everyone. And thank you, Dean Bay, for that warm introduction and for welcoming me to the USC Center on Public Diplomacy at the Annenberg School. I'm only sorry we couldn't have this event in person I would planned to travel to Los Angeles this summer after returning from an official trip to Asia, but the Delta variant unfortunately made that impossible. I have to say, I'm delighted to be with you virtually, but I'm jealous uh, when I see the students in the hallways 
uh, because I taught the last semester at Harvard Kennedy School virtually over my computer with students all over the world, uh, people who would uh, get up in the middle of the night just to take class. And to be able to be in a classroom with students again would be just wonderful. So congratulations uh, to you all for making it possible to have people in person in masks, uh, perhaps with testing protocols, but uh, to be able to have that conversation. I look forward to taking your questions later on from you and then from your audience. Uh, there's no question that I have to begin with Afghanistan. Uh, earlier this week, the US military mission in Afghanistan ended. Like all wars, this one came with an enormous cost. Fiscal costs, of course, by some estimates, between 150 million and 300 million per day, per day, over 20 years. But as we were painfully reminded by last week's terrorist attack, the war had a profound human cost as well for the women and men of our armed forces, for our diplomats and humanitarian workers, and above all, for the Afghan people. President Biden has spoken at length about his decision to end the war, so I'm not going to repeat his remarks here. But I will say, what I will say is that while our military mission in Afghanistan has ended, our diplomatic mission and our commitment to the Afghan people and to our American citizens has not. It is too dangerous right now for our diplomats to be on the ground in Afghanistan. There is no formal government yet in Kabul and ISIS-K and other terrorist organizations remain an active threat. So we've set up a team in Doha, Qatar to continue our diplomatic work, maintaining consular services for people in Afghanistan, including any Americans providing humanitarian aid and coordinating our engagement and messaging to the Taliban with our allies, partners, and regional and international stakeholders. And we are continuing to identify ways to help Americans, foreign nationals, and at-risk Afghans to travel from Afghanistan if they wish to do so. None of us are under any illusions about who the Taliban are. In 1997, I joined then Secretary of State Madeleine Albright when she visited Afghan women and girls in a refugee camp in Peshawar, Pakistan. Many of them had, had fled Kabul when the Taliban seized the city a year earlier. It was one of the most searing meetings I've had in my years as a diplomat. I had a teenage daughter at home at the time. A girl a bit younger than my daughter told me about seeing her sister being raped and then thrown from a window. Women who were doctors, teachers, and homemakers told us about all the ways their lives had been circumscribed and how they hoped their daughter's futures could be different. Their pain, their stories, their hopes for the future are something I carry with me every day. Taliban leaders have made many public pronouncements and commitments about allowing women to continue their work and girls to continue their studies, about permitting freedom of movement for foreign nationals and Afghans who wish to travel and leave the country, about preventing terrorists from once again finding a safe haven, about re refraining from retaliation against Afghans who worked with the United States or our allies and partners, about building a government that is inclusive for all Afghans. At no point have we taken the Taliban at their word in the last weeks, and we're going, not going to begin taking them at their word now. We will judge the Taliban as we have been doing based on what they do. And if they violate their commitments, we will work with our allies and partners to respond accordingly. As the UN Security Council said, in no uncertain terms this past week. You've heard me invoke our allies and partners repeatedly, and there's a reason for that. President Biden is committed to a foreign policy in which the United States leads with diplomacy. As strong as the United States is when we stand on our own, as much power and influence as we have in the world, we are that much stronger when we work together with others 
who share our values and our vision for a peaceful, prosperous, rules-based international order. Our allies and partners helped us organize and make real the historic airlift of more than 124,000 people, Americans, foreign nationals, and Afghans at risk from Afghanistan in an incredibly short period of time. Without them, we could not have built a network of countries on four continents to host tens of thousands of Afghans who left Afghanistan. Thanks to those countries giving people a safe place to land, we've already been able to clear thousands of at-risk Afghans to travel onward to the United States. Our allies and partners are critical to the United States work across the entire Indo-Pacific region and indeed around the world. Now, this isn't news to you at USC, but elsewhere in the country, people sometimes forget that the United States is a Pacific nation. We're a Pacific power, not just because of our geography on the Pacific Ocean, but because of our economy, our culture, our history, and our deep network of alliances and partnerships across Asia and the Pacific. Since I was sworn in as Deputy Secretary of State in April, as uh, Willow Bay said, as Dean Bay said, I've traveled around the world twice. Both of those trips included time in the Indo-Pacific. In June, I visited three Southeast Asian nations, Cambodia, Thailand, and Indonesia, to demonstrate our commitment to ASEAN centrality, uh, to look at the problems uh, in uh, Burma, Myanmar, and to partnering with dynamic and growing countries in the region. And in July, I visited three vital democratic allies and partners in Northeast Asia, Japan, the Republic of Korea, and Mongolia to talk about everything from our security relationship to the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula to climate change and to the COVID-19 pandemic. After those visits, I traveled to the People's Republic of China for meetings with government officials. The bilateral relationship between the United States and the People's Republic of China is a complex one. And so our policy approach toward the PRC is nuanced as well. We will compete and compete vigorously with the PRC where we should, including on trade and the economy, technology and innovation. We will cooperate with the PRC when it is in our interest to do so and in the world's interest to do so, such as on climate change, global health, counter narcotics and non-proliferation and we will challenge the PRC where we must, such as actions when, that are counter to America's values and interests or those of our allies and partners, or which threaten the rules-based international order we have all worked so hard to build. I wanna say a brief word about why the rules-based international order is so important. In the first half of the 20th century, the world was twice embroiled in global conflicts, war, that claimed tens of millions of lives. We suffered through the Great Depression and a devastating global flu pandemic. So after World War II, leaders came together to build new institutions and agreements to promote shared peace and prosperity. The United Nations, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the World Bank, the World Health Organization, and it's made a difference. There have been terrible wars, conflicts that caused a great deal of suffering and strife, but not like World War I or World War II. There have been severe economic crises, but none so deep, widespread, and long lasting as the Great Depression. This event is virtual because we are living through a global pandemic, but the 1918 flu pandemic is believed to have killed 30 million people out of a global population of less than 2 billion. That's not to say the rules-based international order is perfect, it's not. Like any institution, the international system is fallible. It's built by people and we all make mistakes. And it's on all of us in the international community to own up to that and to fix it. But having one set of transparent, consistent, agreed upon rules to govern international relations in trade, in commerce, 
on the internet and on the battlefield. That's the very definition of a level playing field. And the People's Republic of China has big one, been one of the biggest beneficiaries of that rules-based international order over the last half century. Trade and economic development have built a booming middle class and lifted tens of millions out of extreme poverty in the PRC. Today, however, Beijing is seeking to undermine the very system that benefited them, to return to a system where strong nations can coerce smaller countries into acting against their own interests. But it's the business of diplomacy and of public diplomacy to have open, honest, frank conversations, even perhaps especially on issues where we disagree. That is what responsible nations do. The United States will continue to deepen our relationships and our cooperation with our allies and partners. That's what drives so much of the international travel we do from the State Department, including my trip this summer to Japan, Korea, Mongolia, my previous trip to Southeast Asia. There's so many areas where we are collaborating with our allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific and where that work will benefit the American people, which is really what this is all about. Let me give you two examples. President Biden intends to make sure we build back better from COVID-19. The pandemic revealed serious weaknesses in our global supply chains. Remember last spring when nobody could find masks or hand sanitizers? So we are working with our allies, including Japan and the Republic of Korea, to build more resilient supply chains, especially for items that are critical to our economy, our national security, our public health. This work will make our country stronger in the face of the next pandemic. And sadly, because of climate change, among other things, there will likely be another pandemic. And it will help create jobs and opportunity here in the United States as well. Or take the climate crisis. The United States is the world's second largest emitter of greenhouse gas pollution. Every region of the country is feeling the effects from the severe wildfires you've seen in California to the devastating flooding that Ida unleashed just this week in the Gulf and all the way up the Northeast coast of our country. China, the PRC, is the world's number one greenhouse gas polluter. And that's why climate change is one of the areas where we hope to cooperate with Beijing. But climate change is important to our allies and partners as well. Japan and the Republic of Korea want to build more clean energy at home and help developing countries do the same. ASEAN nations are incredibly vulnerable to climate impacts and young people there are pushing hard for their governments to do more. I was able to have fabulous discussion with young climate uh, entrepreneurs uh, in every many of the countries in which I visited. Our special presidential envoy for climate, former Secretary of State John Kerry, is barnstorming the world ahead of the UN Conference of Parties in Glasgow this fall. And this is an all hands on deck effort for the State Department and all of us from Secretary Blinken on down, finding ways to work with countries on this truly global challenge. Everywhere I go, I try to speak with young people. As I did at the Kennedy School, I have always found that it's a nation's young people who see most clearly the challenges we face and what it will take to address them. The issues that so many of you are passionate about from climate change to public health, to racial and gender equity, to human rights are increasingly at the forefront of our diplomacy. And I expect they will stay there for many years to come. So thank you for your interest in the world and your commitment to make it better. I hope you all will consider a career in public diplomacy, uh, in joining the foreign service or the civil service, or one of my sister and brother departments or agencies that work around the world. We need every single one of you. And thank you again to the Center on Public Diplomacy and the USC Annenberg School for all you're doing to bring all of us together in the mission of diplomacy and public diplomacy. Thank you again for joining us today. And I look forward to my conversation with you, Dean Bay, and with everyone who has listened to these brief remarks. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank, thank you, Deputy Secretary. Um, so appreciate 
those remarks and, and your gracious acknowledgement of us and the work we're doing here. And please call me Willow. Um, I thought what I would call me, you can call me Wendy. <laughs> I don't know if I'll go that far, but um, thank you. Um, I would like to follow up on just some of the things that you touched upon in your remarks and then perhaps broaden it out after that to get just to tap into your vast experience in, in the field. Um, I would like to start uh, about uh, on the subject of Afghanistan. You know, as you well know, in the aftermath of the US withdrawal um, and the horrifying scenes that followed adversaries are gloating and allies are looking for clarity. So I'm wondering from your perspective, how much has US credibility in international endeavors been damaged by this and what can you do um, and State Department do to restore that credibility? First of all, um, Willow, all of those scenes were wrenching for all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, those were my colleagues who were at that airport helping to save lives. Uh, my chief of staff, who is an Afghan refugee himself, um, I asked him if he wanted to go to help out. Uh, he speaks uh, Dari. Um, he in fact left with his family from that very airport as a child uh, to come to the United States. So he went, so I have heard a great deal about what went on and it's very tough for all of us, uh, tough for everyone. Um, my experience about how the United States is seen is a little bit different than what you're describing. This morning, I had a VTC with 40 countries, uh, most of whom have been on an every other day VTC, countries from the Gulf, countries from Asia, countries from Latin America, from Africa, from Europe, uh, from Central Asia, who have come together uh, to talk about what has gone on, how we can help each other, how we can build a network to get things done. And quite frankly, they have all said to me, no other country could have put together this global network. Uh, we uh, shared with everyone a coordinated effort. Uh, to give you one example, uh, I got a call uh, early on in this from the Vice Foreign Minister of Japan uh, there were a group of Japanese diplomats who were a mile and a half from Hikaya, from the airport, uh, and they couldn't figure out how to get to the airport. They started on foot because the streets were jammed with cars. Many people just left their cars there when they got on an airplane, so they were jammed up. Um, but they turned back because of gunfire. Uh, so they called to see what we could do. We were able, <clears throat> the Department of Defense, to provide overwatch as they walked back to the airport. We helped them come into the airport. Uh, they ended up on a, a British plane out of the country. Uh, so Japan, the United States, Great Britain, uh, and uh, our other colleagues in this network uh, helped them to find their way out. We have transit hubs all over the Gulf, all over Europe. Uh, we've had uh, uh, countries like Japan and the Republic of Korea offer uh, to host a transit hub. It's too far away uh, for easy doing, uh, but they have come forward with other ways that they can help and support. So what I've seen is an extraordinary global network that has come together to bring all that they could to bear, uh, organized, coordinated, led if you would, uh, by the United States of America. Uh, and it's just been an, an amazing effort and I'm so grateful to all of my colleagues all over the world. So I wonder um, if that global network can be deployed um, around another issue. I so deeply appreciate your comments about women and girls. Uh, that said, again, in the, in the aftermath of our withdrawal, there's enormous feelings of anger, betrayal, despair over what many believe is our abandoning our commitment to women left behind, particularly the professionals, educators, journalists, and activists that we helped train and support. So what diplomatic tools do you have at your disposal? And perhaps it is leveraging this global network to continue to ensure that the plight of women in that country is centered. You know, I think the all of the feeling about this has emerged on the world stage. There is not a 
partner, ally, country that has been part of this, that has not spoken to this issue, that wants to make sure that women and girls have a future in Afghanistan, that they lives are not circumscribed, they are not hidden in houses and not able to work as professionals or get an education. Uh, the Taliban have said uh, better things than they have in the past, but the proof will be in the pudding. I saw today that a group of women in Herat actually were brave enough to go and protest on the street. And I went to Afghanistan when I was under secretary for political affairs and actually met with a group of women leaders in Herat. I wonder if they're the same extraordinary women that I met with. So I think there's another difference here, which is the women of Afghanistan have experienced uh, what it is to be part of a community. Uh, whatever choice they make to be a homemaker, a mother, uh, to be a professional, to be a teacher, uh, whatever their choice is. And I don't think they will easily go back. And I think that every country uh, that is engaged with the Taliban uh, has said to them, you cannot go back 20 years. Uh, you cannot go back to the 1970s. Uh, that's not where this country is anymore. That's not where the world is anymore. Uh, and one of the things that I've noticed in the VTCs I've been doing is there are more and more women from countries that never had women on the screen before speaking on behalf of their countries. The whole world has changed. So what this means is we all have to continue to speak up. We all have to say that if the Taliban form a government and want, want legitimacy, part of that legitimacy has to be inclusion of women and given women the right to have a future, to be educated uh, for themselves and for their daughters and for their sons, that it be an inclusive society. Um, I think we have a lot of tools. We have diplomatic tools, we have economic tools, uh, we have public diplomacy tools um, to really try to do this. And I have heard the whole world community from all parts of the world uh, speak to this very issue. And that's very different than in the past. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, turning now to some other elements of um, your Indo-Pacific strategy, PRC. As you outlined, the bilateral relationship with China will be characterized by competition, cooperation, and challenges where values don't align. Um, given it is clear that as the two biggest emitters of carbon dioxide, the US and China must work together to combat climate change. How are you thinking about working with China as a partner in this case? Well, it's interesting. The special presidential envoy for climate, John Kerry, is just coming out of meetings in Tianjin uh, in China. Uh, the PRC is not allowing anyone to have meetings in Beijing uh, because of COVID. They have incredibly strict uh, COVID protocols, which I experienced uh, myself when I went. Uh, and um, he's had uh, meetings at all levels of uh, uh, their government uh, and pushed very hard. He, this is the second time he's met with his counterpart uh, and with others as well in uh, the PRC. Um, we aren't where we need to be yet. Uh, China keeps saying that it's a developing country and in some ways it is, but in some ways it is now a, a developed country. It's a very mixed uh, kind of, it's an emerging developed country uh, and very developed in many ways. And so uh, China does not want to be uh, held back from what it feels it needs to do, um, but uh, it has a responsibility, uh, not only to the people in their own country where pollution is a terrible problem and creates health issues for them and costs, uh, but if they want to be a responsible nation in the world, this is what responsible nations do. They step up and they meet tough challenges as President Biden is doing uh, and change the paradigm uh, for how we all live, uh, how we all work, create high value jobs in a, a, a really rich uh, climate change environment uh, and uh, get on with not only saving the planet, but uh, the human race and, and the world in which we live. So you described China as, I believe you called them transactional, right? Basically, as you put it, you let us do whatever we want to do and then we will cooperate. And that simply doesn't represent what American values are as, as you shared. So what strategies will you deploy 
to move past those types of standoffs and insist that the partnership and cooperation align around values. Well, I think there are some areas in which the PRC will work with us uh, and we will try to build on those, but we've made very clear, and I certainly made very clear in the meetings I held, uh, in what we believe. Uh, we uh, believe, for instance, that what is happening in Xinjiang uh, is horrendous, uh, that what is happening to the Uyghurs is abhorrent, uh, that it is not about an internal matter for which we have no business, which is the PRC's approach. Uh, it is about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and what we have all signed up to, including the PRC has signed up to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And that's what it's about. Uh, I had a meeting uh, when I was in Mongolia, I had a virtual meeting uh, with journalists, uh, not as a press conference, but to hear their stories of trying to be a journalist inside the PRC. Some of them uh, that were in the virtual meeting with me had been kicked out. Uh, and they told me stories about the surveillance on what they did, on going on vacations and being surveilled, their children being surveilled at school, uh, the difficulties they had, the uh, inability to travel in the country and report on stories, and yet the tremendous courage they had uh, to have a freedom of the press of any sort, uh, and what they hoped for. Uh, in terms of what the Chinese are looking for in terms of media representation in the United States and what they hope for. So we are working on some of these issues because they are critical uh, to what should happen in any uh, great nation in the world. Uh, China is a huge, huge country uh, with a strong economy and growth. Um, and so it needs to step up. It's a member of the permanent members of the Security Council and great nations solve these very difficult problems. Uh, and so we are challenging China to do just that. Um, share with me a little bit, if you will, your thoughts on building alliances with other nations in the region, particularly smaller countries who may not want to appear to be taking sides in what's an increasingly complicated, if not tense, US-China relationship, right? They live in China's neighborhood and they don't want to upset an increasingly aggressive China. What is your strategy for building and deepening alliances with other countries in the region? Great question. Uh, it's why on the first trip I took, um, I started after some meetings in Europe, uh, I went to um, Indonesia uh, where ASEAN uh, sits and lives, uh, had bilateral meetings in Indonesia, but also met with all the permanent representatives at ASEAN uh, because we want to affirm ASEAN centrality, uh, that ASEAN is a critical regional organization we wanted to stand with them in what they are trying to do for the region. Um, we also wanted to give a clear message. And I've said this to the PRC as well. We are not asking countries to choose between the United States and China. We understand that countries uh, want to have a relationship with both of us. They want investment from both of us. Uh, they want trade from both of us. Uh, they want stability and security, and they want us both to affirm that will happen. They want to have uh, a free and open Indo-Pacific uh, where there is maritime uh, freedom of movement, uh, where uh, they can be part of the international community. Uh, so I think regional organizations are very important for small groups. Same thing with the Pacific Island nations uh, to see them as a group and work with them as a group so that they have extra strength and can uh, punch above uh, their weight. Um, so I think all of these are efforts uh, to make sure that countries know they don't have to make a choice, but what they do have to do is not give in to economic coercion by the PRC, uh, not give in to exploitation by the PRC, uh, stand up for themselves, and we will be there as a partner for them to make their own choices and not be coerced by anyone. Um, and I love your, by the way, I love your story about meeting the young climate entrepreneurs. Um, 
you know, in, in the Southeast Asian nations. And we'd love to try to find a way to partner some of some of those entrepreneurs with uh, with some in our own country. And which brings me to the topic of LA. And, you know, we, obviously we know you wanted to be in, here in person and, and you were making a very strong statement about the role of cities, I believe, um, in that. Um, why is it so important for you to engage with communities here in Southern California on the administration's um, Indo-Pacific and wider um, diplomatic strategies? Uh, there's not a mayor or a governor in this country or a county executive that isn't involved in trade with the rest of the world. Um, even medium-sized businesses and entrepreneurial businesses want export markets. Uh, they want to engage in the world. Los Angeles is one of the most diverse, if not the most diverse cities in the world. Uh, earlier today, um, your uh, terrific outstanding deputy mayor, who was once uh, the ambassador to ASEAN, Nina Hajitian, um, organized a group uh, for me to meet with to talk about uh, not only anti-Asian hate, uh, and some of the painful things that have gone on, uh, but to talk in general about diversity and how we all need to emphasize diversity around the world and what we do. I talked about um, how uh, Los Angeles and California probably has more Afghan Americans than anywhere else in the country. Uh, and I suspect because of extended families, more Afghans are coming your way. Uh, they're going to feel a need to be welcomed by communities, uh, not be suspect by communities. Um, and uh, you also have a large uh, Vietnamese diaspora that's had this, this exact experience that can help new uh, people coming into the communities. There's no longer really a difference between domestic and foreign policy. Um, what we do around the world has to matter for Americans, uh, particularly working in middle class. It has to mean something. Uh, if I go off to the PRC, uh, it's about making sure that asthma does not intensify for kids in the United States because we have pollution, uh, because we haven't addressed climate change, or that we can't get ready for the next pandemic and make sure that our kids can continue to go to school uh, and don't have to wear masks. I've got two little grandkids, they're now going to school in masks uh, mm -hmm. and it's tough. Uh, it breaks my heart that that is their experience and that they had to as a five and a seven year old sit in front of a computer. So all of these things, growth, jobs for the future are tied to the rest of the world. So given, you know, given the importance of cities in this work, is, is state considering more partnerships or more mechanisms to support that, the role of cities in this regard? Absolutely. Uh, I think it's very critical. It's very critical to our public diplomacy, uh, a part of the department. Uh, and I would suspect you'll see more and more and more of that kind of engagement and more of what I'm trying to do, which I hope to do more in public and use radio and every other device uh, to talk to the American people about what we're doing and why it has anything to do with their day-to-day -day lives. It has everything to do with our day-to-day -day lives. By the way, we are Nina Hashigi and fans and friends as well. So I'm so glad that you That's were great. Able to that virtual visit with her today. I'm going to change topics dramatically and then go to the audience questions. But you know, you have such an extraordinary wealth of experience in this space, and we'd love just to get you know, given given our work as educators in this space and and with the center, you know. From 30,000 feet up, what so much about the world today is, diff is different, but what has changed the most in your realm, in the realm of public diplomacy, in terms of what you see on the ground and what you engage with around the negotiating table? We're all connected in a way that we weren't 20 years ago. Um, 20 years ago, uh, we didn't have this, mm -hmm. an ability to talk with each other. So today, when about 40 countries, we were all on a BTC together uh, without anybody having to travel anywhere. Uh, we were able to communicate. We were be able to plan. Uh, we were, are able to work together. 
Secretary Blinken had a virtual meeting earlier this week uh, with the G7, the EU, NATO, uh, Qatar, and Turkey to talk about getting the airport up and running, among other things. Uh, all things Afghanistan, he'll be doing another virtual meeting uh, likely uh, next week. Um, it doesn't substitute for traveling because people to people matters enormously to sit across the table. Earlier today, the Foreign Secretary of India was here uh, and I met with him and we were talking about all of the issues we're talking about on this. Um, so technology has changed things dramatically. Uh, we have a world where cyber matters enormously in California, particularly Northern California, but also in Los Angeles. You all are technology mavens. Uh, you understand this. This has changed the world dramatically. The way we communicate is dramatically different. The young people that you teach at the Annenberg School, at the Center for Public Diplomacy, um, just deal differently in the world. I learned a lot from my students about how to communicate uh, and how to use technology uh, to do that. So I can't even imagine, uh, we have a effort here underway around cyber and emerging technology. What's it gonna mean for diplomacy and how do we get organized now to imagine that future? It's gonna be very different. And then if, if continuing just on this a moment, you know, you described a real change in um, I, maybe the interpersonal dynamics is a good way to describe it, you know, particularly in your relationship with um, Chinese diplomats. Are you seeing those kind of shifts in attitudes, the strength, the confidence um, in behaviors of diplomats from other regions? Or is that was that specific to China? I think China has gained enormous confidence. Uh, you know, I've been a diplomat since um, on and off since uh, President Clinton. And uh, in those days, uh, when I was with diplomats from the PRC, uh, they would always have to go back to Beijing to get more instructions. And then over time, um, they were able to do a little bit more on their own. And now they're very uh, sophisticated diplomats uh, and they can operate um, quite independently in part because uh, they all use the same words, the same lines. Um, they are better coordinated internally to deliver that message. Um, so it has changed over time very much. And I would say most of the diplomats with whom I engage are quite sophisticated, uh, quite professional. Uh, even in the developing world, we all engage so much. Uh, and certainly the United Nations has brought everyone together. Uh, we are gonna have later in September, some of it virtually, some in person, uh, the United Nations General Assembly High Level Week. Uh, this is usually what we call diplomatic speed dating, uh, where everybody in the world comes to New York and from seven in the morning to 11 o'clock at night, every half an hour, you're seeing somebody different. Um, it won't be that way this year because of COVID, uh, but nonetheless, um, both virtually and in person, uh, diplomacy matters. Public diplomacy is a critical set of tools, uh, more so than ever uh, because of the way the world is interconnected. Thank you. So I'm going to go to audience questions, if that's okay with you. And I'd love to start. Sure. With from, I'd love to start with one from a student. Um, which is what advice do you have for a student who wants to improve their negotiation skills, perhaps even for a career in diplomacy? In other words, where did you get your extensive skills? It's a great question. And, um, you know, I taught uh, uh, negotiations uh, courses and sessions, but I've never taken a negotiation course in my life. Um, I was originally trained as a social worker as a community organizer and a clinician. And I use those same set of skills. When you're an organizer, you have to learn the whole landscape. You have to see the whole picture. You have to figure out what the objective is and what's the strategy for getting there. You have to understand all of the interests of the people involved and how you can bring that interest to a common purpose. Um, being a clinician, having clinical skills helps me to sort of read people, very helpful with dictators and members of Congress too. Um, so I think uh, it is a skill set that one should practice in whatever you're doing. 
So let's say even if you're trying to uh, work in your student government at, NS, at uh, USC, and you're trying to get everybody to move together to accomplish a goal, well, you have to negotiate to get there. For those of you who are parents already, if you have a two-year-old or a teenager, you've practiced negotiation skills uh, on a constant basis. Uh, so it's not magic. There are techniques, there are tactics you can learn, uh, but at the end of the day, it's not about the tactics, it's about everything else. Um, it's what happens outside the room. You all have watched Hamilton, I'm sure, uh, or gone to see it. Uh, and you know that one of the critical uh, acts that was necessary to get to our constitution didn't happen in the negotiating room. It happened over a dinner between Washington and Jefferson. Uh, because sometimes it's outside of the room that the most important things happen in the context matters, uh, the culture matters, um, the purpose matters. Uh, so lots to learn, but a lot of it is just practice, practice, practice. We have so many great questions in across a, an enormous range of topics. So I'm just going to try to give you a little sampler of them. Um, and let's start with one that, that came in um, from the folks who RSVP'd, which is among the threats to American security. What do you see as the priority? Afghanistan, North Korea, Taiwan, COVID-19. Oh, uh, you know, uh, being the Deputy Secretary of State just reinforces again that we have to walk, chew gum, play soccer, go to the computer, take care of our kids, um, get up in the morning and go to work. It's everything. Um, it's why we have not only a vast array of people and talent and skill here in the Department of State, but in our embassies all over the world. Um, while I'm working on Afghanistan and we're 24-7, uh, Ambassador Sung Kim, who's our ambassador to Indonesia, but also the special representative on North Korea, is traveling to meet his counterparts, coming back here for consultations, and trying to move that agenda forward while so many of us had to be focused on Afghanistan in the last days. Uh, so unfortunately, we don't always get to pick what our priorities are. Uh, often the world comes at us and we have to be able to work on them all simultaneously and have a fantastic uh, talent pool to draw from. So again, if you all are thinking about what kind of career you want, uh, please think about joining as a civil servant or as a foreign service officer. Uh, we need talent. And we also need diversity. It's incredibly critical that the State Department, our embassies, U.S. government, as the president has said, looks like America and brings all that skill set uh, to bear. So please come join us. Um, in a question from Brian. Um, who asks, it's recently been reported North Korea has ramped up its nuclear operations. With your experience as a presidential special advisor on North Korea, is there any solution to North Korea's growing nuclear threat? Just a simple one that we're going to lob at you. <laughs> yeah, it's a simple question. Um, it's a really tough problem, much tougher than Iran, quite frankly. And that was pretty tough and still is. Um, we have, as we've said publicly, um, let North Korea know that we're ready to sit down and talk without conditions uh, when they're ready to do so. Uh, we are concerned about what is happening inside of North Korea. Uh, there are other players here, of course, uh, South Korea, Japan, Russia, the PRC. They've all, I'm sure, lobbed in messages uh, to the North Koreans to sit down and talk uh, I hope that will happen soon. Uh, we will see. Ambassador Kim is working with his colleagues to figure out uh, how we might get to that place. Uh, so I hope that in the near term uh, that we open a new chapter and can have that kind of really serious discussion and negotiation uh, so that in fact, uh, the people of North Korea uh, have a better future. Right now they are facing uh, a very difficult economic situation, difficult COVID situation, 
uh, and uh, we, we hope we get help them get to a better place. Um, question on a few other regions. So there's a question on Europe. After focusing on China, how committed uh, is the U.S. to the security of Europe? And has Brexit changed the balance? And is Europe, is Europe itself doing enough for its own security? All great questions. Uh, on my first trip, I started in Brussels uh, to meet with NATO, uh, but also to meet with the European Union and to hold the first US, EU, China dialogue. Uh, we'll have another one here this fall and, and meet on a quarterly basis. Um, and that was in part to really uh, Europe and the United States to share with each other how we saw our work with the PRC. Uh, it was a terrific uh, set of conversations. We both had interagency teams from across our governments. Uh, and I think that we have come much closer to each other in our approach. It's not to say there aren't differences, there will always be differences. But we so share the basic strategic approach here uh, and objective that I think we are much closer together in how we are moving forward. And we are always much stronger when we are together than when we are apart. I think that um, Europe is adjusting to Brexit. Uh, there is still more to go. On security issues, we all still work together uh, without really a great deal of change. Uh, and uh, our European colleagues have been very engaged on Afghanistan, uh, the British and UK forces uh, present at uh, HKIA. Uh, so that I think has worked out uh, very well. Uh, and in terms of their own security, a lot of discussion. Uh, they've made some progress against their commitment, their NATO spending commitments for their defense budgets. Um, more to come. Uh, but I think they understand uh, what is necessary uh, for the security of Europe. Right, and then another region, um, a, a potentially an overlooked uh, regional perspective, um, uh, according to this questioner, what is the State Department's role in African economic development? To what extent does China's influence there limit our opportunity? Africa's tremendously important. Some of the fastest growing economies in the world are in Africa. Um, the labor force of the future, if not right now, uh, is in Africa. Um, there's tremendous opportunity. Uh, I hope uh, to go there soon myself. Um, uh, we've had uh, some travel there even during the time of COVID by some of my colleagues, but I hope to get there uh, soon myself. Um, tremendously important, lots of countries with potential, uh, with young, tons of entrepreneurs. I remember during the Obama administration when the Young African Leaders Initiative was begun, there were 500 slots, I think something like 50,000 young people in Africa uh, applied to be uh, part of those 500 entrepreneurs to come here and be mentored uh, so they could go back and build their own uh, small businesses. So there's tremendous energy uh, coming from Africa. Uh, we have to be there. Uh, it's critical to engage. Uh, China has had a mixed uh, set of experiences. Uh, they've offered a lot to a lot of countries, often with loans that come with uh, harsh realities. Uh, they've brought in their own uh, workforce as opposed to transfer uh, capabilities to the African countries themselves. Um, and so it's been sometimes a bitter pill uh, for African countries uh, to take support from the PRC. But there's no question that the PRC has been very active uh, and it is incumbent on us and our allies uh, to be equally present and supportive as African nations uh, try to move forward. I have one last question for you because I know we're about to, to be um, out of time, but it, it sort of follows up on what you were talking about with, with the um, great entrepreneurial spirit that you all saw in the African nations. Um, this, is from a, this is from Wendy. Which one or two innovation areas do you see U.S. businesses, academia, and innovation hubs? Um, that, which ones do they need to focus on? And how do you see where we are, U.S., as compared to PRC's laser sharp focus on the Internet of Things? things, artificial intelligence, green energy, et cetera. So <clears throat> President Biden is all over this. Um, his view of building back better world 
in this post COVID, which I hope we get to, we're starting to get to, um, is uh, to really make sure that America is where it needs to be on artificial intelligence, quantum computing, uh, the internet of things, um, space, um, the technology of the future, uh, all our supply chains resilient and ready to go um, to really look to the future. Uh, we're trying to do that here as well, as I mentioned, around cyber and emerging technology. Uh, so for me, uh, it is the world I probably won't still be here for, uh, but the one that will be essential for all of the students who are listening to this today or watching. Um, so that's the area where we need to go and how to harness those technologies uh, to help. Uh, one of my students at the Harvard Kennedy School uh, was asked by, uh, she's an engineering student, was asked by um, the city of Boston to see if she couldn't figure out a way to unclog ice in the cut gutters of homes, which really uh, creates huge problems in the winter in Boston uh, for homeowners. So she figured out how to use drones to break up the ice and to solve that problem uh, for homeowners. So there are just so many creative ideas that you all have about using technology to solve problems. So please go forward. It's important to the future of our jobs. It's important to the future of our world. Um, thank you so much for that. I'm gonna put my mask on because I have a little surprise for you just to say goodbye and thank you. Real live students in person. Oh my gosh, that's so fantastic. <laughs> Thank That's you. so great. Thank you so much. I'm so jealous. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for coming Thank today. For Thank you so much. Debbie. I'll put Thank mine back on too. I have to wear a mask here too. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your time with us today and your wisdom. And we wish you the best of luck. You have a please a rain check for coming back and visiting us in person anytime. We would so love to host you. Super, I look forward to it. Thank you so much, Willow. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Barry. And thank you, students. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye.